Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. I'm excited to have Lisa Miller joining me today. Um, for those who don't know Lisa, Lisa's a co-host of ABC News Breakfast. She began her career in regional Queensland on the Gympie Times in 1988. She has also spent two years in Townsville working for Win TV before joining the ABC. She has worked for online radio and television over the past three decades. She completed three foreign postings, reporting from 40 countries, and was Bureau Sh Chief in Washington, D.C. and London. She won a Wakeley Award for Investigative Reporting and was a director on the board of the Dart Centre for Journalism and Trauma for 10 years. And I'm um, talking to Lisa today about her book, Daring to Fly, hopefully... You can see my copy there. Oh, it's disappearing away it a little bit if I hold it over here. Yep, and you've got your one there. Um, so thanks so much, Lisa, for joining us. I have to mention I just finished reading Daring to Fly and really loved it. Had some interesting and surprising things that I found in there. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm very keen to find out what was interesting and what was surprising but thank you very much and thanks for the invitation Jackie it's great to join you just wondering if you want to start off by maybe telling us a little bit about daring to fly and what you got into what you got into writing up well daring to fly is a memoir uh I wanted to explain to people how I'd ended up where I was I guess and the fact that I was just a, a country kid who grew mm. up in a very small town in Queensland called Kilkeven and I had a happy childhood and uh, I often joke with Rick Morton who wrote the wonderful book 100 Years of Dirt that he wrote about this terribly traumatic childhood and I said to him I feel like I'm sort of doing the cheats version it was like I didn't have anything to complain about but yeah. I did have a great dream and that was to become a journalist and it was something that I had within me for a long time I ended up achieving that dream but boy what a roller coaster it was along the way because I developed a terrible fear of flying mm. that came about after mm. an incident mid-air in a small plane when I was a young reporter. Mm. And then I had to get over that to become a foreign correspondent, not knowing that I would then be at the centre of some of the biggest, most traumatic stories that we've seen over the last couple of decades, mm. starting my first posting in Washington just after September 11 mm. in 2001. And through all of that, I don't know whether it's because my middle name is Joy, but I have managed to keep the joy. I've learned a lot about what trauma can do to your mind. I've learned a lot about getting over fear mm. and how you can do it and how empowering it is. And I also give people in the book a lot of behind the scenes of what it is actually like being a foreign correspondent and zipping around the world for the ABC, a job that I think I was absolutely privileged to have. Yeah. And people are genuinely very curious. They turn on their televisions and they expect the correspondents to be there or they listen to AM or the world today. But then the feedback that I've received is that they'll never be able to do that again without thinking of some of the things that I wrote about in the book, that mm -hmm. they took it for granted mm -hmm. in a way that mm. the reporters would be there yeah yeah and what made you want to write your memoir and is it something you've been meaning to do for a long time and you've just got round to it or i'd have been asked by a few publishers actually to consider doing it uh when i was overseas i was approached but i just said i couldn't possibly think where i would have the capacity or mm. time mm. to do it and when I came to back to Australia in 2018, I was going to be living in Queensland and catching up with my family. Instead, I got offered the job of ABC News Breakfast co-host and in August 2019, moved to Melbourne, which was a new city for me. Mm. What a great few months I had initially. Mm. And then of course- It didn't last long. We know what happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't need to explain it. 
And uh, the wonderful Louise Adler, who was working at Hachette at the time, uh, approached me and said, come on, time for you to start writing. And she promised that she'd hold my hand through the process, and she did, even though some of it, most of it, was on the phone, mm. uh, of course, because we couldn't see each other. But it ended up being the most wonderful project she promised me she said you might just enjoy it so stop <laughs> whinging and it ended up being amazing because i i sat in my home in melbourne when i was only allowed out for an hour a day and mm. when my job finished at 9 a.m every mm. morning and i was able to then engage and do interviews with everyone i just decided you know what i can rely on my memory and then i'm going to actually ring everyone who's in the book and have these conversations and i did and that it was it was cheaper than a therapist <laughs> yeah i was going to say that as well like how did all the traumatic things that you have gone through in your work and that did you find it healing writing about some oh. of them or was it hard rehashing yeah, them and yeah. that as well and well jackie there's one particular chapter that i cannot read yet without my heart racing mm. and that's that period in 2017 and the europe time mm. and and people say to me like they they their heart is pounding mm. when they're reading because of the mm. drama mm. And, and i gave it so phil williams who was the former chief foreign correspondent for the abc he was there in london for a lot of that time and i got him to read it to proofread that particular chapter and he rang me and he said god that's harrowing <laughs> and i said yeah but you were there yeah, yeah. he said yeah but it's still harrowing mm. to read it because i think at the time jackie you just get on with the job you know, yeah you've got a job to do and you're, you're running on running on adrenaline a bit totally and, running yeah. on adrenaline and mm. you know no sleep and you know and then there were times also when i was writing about losing mum and dad mm. when i was overseas still as a correspondent and not being back in australia mm -hmm. when that happened um i found it tricky actually to do the audio guide the audio book and they warned me when i turned up to when the recording wrote, studio yeah. that sometimes it can be a bit hard mm. doing the memoir mm. i said oh no i talk for a living it'll be fine <laughs> i said guess what it wasn't fine yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. And we've got lots of people watching, which is great. And I've got some questions coming through. So I'll um, read out some of the questions we've got. Um, Kelly wonders if it's harder being a journalist or an author. Oh, <laughs> um, an author. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been training to be a journalist since I was seven years old. I've had so many friends write books and uh, Lee Sales is my best friend and I've yeah. seen her go through the process that I am in awe. I am in awe of people who can write books mm. and people like Gideon Haig, the great um, writer, you know, he does a lot of cricket writing, but he churns out books at a rate of knots that I find absolutely astounding. Um, I sought a lot of advice from other authors to ask them, how do you do it? In fact, any podcast with an author where they were asked, how did you write? Mm. I would just consume it thinking, okay, I'm doing my research. I'll find out how can I do this? Uh, but it was because of Louise that I was able to get through it all. She clearly spotted me as a goody two shoes who always <laughs> met a deadline. So she just kept giving me tasks. She'd send me away and say, go and write 5,000 words about your grandmother. Yeah. Go and write 5,000 mm. words about working at the Gimby Times. Mm. And that eventually added up to 90,000 words. Mm. And before I knew it, we had a book. Yeah, yeah. And I love myself, like, the, talking about your family. It sounds like you're a really close-knit family. And the um, how the plane fitted in with the family as well. I love that. Yeah, mm. that was it. Was India Echo Charlie? Yeah, a beautiful little Piper With, Cherokee yeah. that my grandmother helped bring into our family, mm. and it was like a member of the family. Mm. So that was one of the amazing things that happened with the process of writing. Jackie was that I tracked our plane down. Yeah, yeah. So it was later. only because of the book that you did that. 
Yeah, yeah. That was only because of the book. Mm. Um, so mm. none of that would have happened. And my big sister and I went on a road trip out to the hangar in Mergen mm. in Queensland and uh, found India Echo Charlie. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. Mm. And Sarah's got a good question. She wonders what are some of the strategies you find work to cope with the traumatic events you have experienced and to move on to the next? Look, I learned a lot over the years. When I first started as a young police reporter at the Daily Sun newspaper mm -hmm. in, in Brisbane that no longer exists, I didn't know what I was doing, you know. It, I sort of was stumbling through some really tough stories and uh, I had an incredible experience, Jackie, if I could just share with you. And sorry, Sarah, I will answer your question in a minute. But I was in Dolby at a writer's festival a week ago and I was a young police reporter on the Daily Sun and I used to go and we do what we call death knocks where you go and knock on someone's door after they'd had they'd lost oh, someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I did it when I was 21 years old. Mm. It was, I've always feared that I had caused more grief to people by doing it. Mm. But I didn't question my editors. I just went and did it. Well, last weekend, a woman came up to me and she said, look, I love your book. I'm a fan. I wasn't sure whether to tell you or not, but you knocked on my door 31 years ago. Mm. And I said, oh... She said, my husband had just died. And I said to her, what happened to him? And as she started telling me the story, I was able to finish her sentence because I remembered exactly mm. who she was. Mm. And I said to her, you know what else? I've still got a copy of that story mm. pasted into a scrapbook. And I sent her a photo of it when I returned home. That was astounding for me that something I'd done 31 years ago as a reporter was, still, was yeah. coming back. Mm. Thankfully, because my first question to her was, please tell me that I did not um, increase your yeah. trauma. More, yeah. She said, no, nah, mm. no. Nah. Mm. Um, but Sarah, sorry, so there are a whole lot of strategies that I now know exist, which is some of them as simple as, getting out and walking in the fresh air, mm. making sure you drink lots of water and you're eating properly, making sure you're sleeping. Sometimes that's just not possible. The other thing that we have within the ABC is a system called peer supporters. And for example, I picked up the phone today and called Avani Dias, who is our New Delhi correspondent. She's only been there six weeks, but I rang her to say, how are you going? You know, mm. how's it been? Because mm. she ended up on a huge story because she was with the Australian cricket team oh. in Pakistan mm. when Shane Warne's, mm. the news of Shane Warne's death came mm. through. So there's a great deal of collegiality where we check in on each other and make sure that we're doing okay and also that you just, you talk things through. But the problem with, and, you know, this is what I go to in the book, is the problem is that with 2017, the, the things that were happening were just one after another, mm. like a dozen terrorist attacks, mm. and then the death of a very dear friend, and then random things happening. Like I'd go to interview someone, and my producer would call this man's secretary a couple of days later to tell her that the story was going to air back in Australia, and he'd been killed by the tractor that he'd been riding just mm, after wow. we'd been interviewing. Mm. And all of that stuff really mm. started playing with my brain. But mm. we do we do get taught so much more now about speaking, about I am not ashamed to say that I'm very happy to pick up the phone and talk to counsellors, yeah. talk to psychiatrists, mm. understand how to reframe things in my mind that might initially be disastrous and terrible and traumatic. And I try and reframe them and find out where the silver lining is here. Like, mm. how can I not let this swallow me up? Mm. Mm. And I'm interested to know, writing a book, is there anything that you learnt or were, were surprised about that you didn't um, think about like before, before you'd yeah. ever thought of writing a book yeah. before? The biggest thing was about my fear of flying, Jackie, mm. that I had never connected the fact 
that my fear of flying, which started when I was in a small plane incident, actually only became this all-encompassing physical catastrophe in my life after I'd had a car accident. Yeah. And uh... it was once I'd written down the dates, I was really, really excited mm. and rang a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist and went, Oh my God, it was actually the car accident. So it wasn't was even the plane. Yeah. And it's that loss of fear, that mm. feeling that, wow, well, if I can't survive in a car, then how am I going to survive in the air kind mm. of thing? And so that for me was such a revelation. Um, the rest of it, I kind of knew bits, but it was wonderful to put a lot of pieces together with different people that I would manage to track down. And that was a really fulfilling mm. um thing to do mm. and how long did the whole process take a year okay yeah, yeah. but i think that's... that's only because of that's only because i had the time yeah so it was like, perfect timing with the lockdowns being out because otherwise you yeah you mightn't have yeah. had the time and and even after lockdown finished and they came back to me and said hey could you write another few thousand words on your time at parliament house mm. as a young female reporter because everyone was talking about the sexism in Canberra mm. and they wanted to know what my experience had been in the 1990s. I reckon they were the hardest 3,000 words to write. Really, yeah. Because my life had sort of mm. returned. I was back in tennis <laughs> lessons and catching up for lunch and having wines on a Friday yeah. <laughs> and a Wednesday. <laughs> Kelly wonders if you could share with us what the most positive, memorable experience you have had. Sometimes the most positive experiences still have come from trauma mm. and terrible experiences. And that is, and I think that goes to what I was saying about trying to reframe things. I mean, one of the women that I just admire so much is the mother of a child who was killed at the Sandy Hook school shooting in Connecticut mm. when 20 tiny kids were just mowed down and six mm. adults were killed. And Veronique Posner, whose son Noah died, I met her on several occasions and was in awe of how she took that tragedy in her life and then campaigned so yeah. hard over the gun laws. And now they've successfully sued the gun companies and there's a massive payout that's coming to the families, which of course they would take their children back in a mm -hmm. flash rather than mm -hmm. the money, but they have made a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing with anything that we face as journalists, that if you feel that your work has been worthy, that you have somehow tried to make a difference, then it helps you process and accept that what you saw and witnessed may have Mate, been yeah. gut-wrenching. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that part in the book was very emotional. I remember reading that part. Mm. But it's amazing what people can do after such traumatic things happening. Mm. Mm. Sharon's wondering what you like to read yourself. Mm. Well, what I like to read and what I have to read for work yeah. are two separate <laughs> things. Probably, yeah. I get exposed to a lot of stuff that I wouldn't necessarily read or certainly read for pleasure because of ABC News Breakfast. So mm. for just off the top of my head, I just read Ed Coper's book called Facts and other lies, I think, and that's all about misinformation and disinformation, mm. which when we're looking at what's happening in Ukraine with Russia, mm. that that's quite fascinating. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm actually, for pleasure, rereading Helen Garner's The First Stone, because uh, okay. it's been yeah. so long since I've read it, and mm. I wanted to read it again. And my, I don't know, you can't call it a guilty pleasure, but I tell you the books that I just love diving into uh, anything by Sally Hepworth. Oh, yes, yeah. She's I a great author. I love Sally's yeah. books. Mm. You know, I just, I find them clever mm. and so easy to read and they 
I just think they're fantastic. They make me feel like I'm having a little holiday yeah. in my brain. Yeah. <laughs> no, in a I, good way. I totally agree with you on her books. They are great. Jeanette um, wonders how you've adjusted back home with the early mornings. Yes, I said to Jackie before we started that one of the questions that I normally get asked very early on is what time does my mm. alarm go off? And it goes mm. off at 3 a.m. Mm. Um, look, it's, it's pretty relentless and gruelling, especially when we have um, such big stories that it's hard not to feel. It's hard not to feel for the people you're reporting on, the... The first day of the floods in Lismore, when we were on air and we didn't have a sense of what was happening, and I got a message on my Instagram that just said in capital letters, help, help, help. Mm. And I was already live on air. It was wow. very early in the mm. morning. And it was from a woman who couldn't get through the mm. SES, couldn't get through the oh, police, wow. and so was messaging me mm. directly on Instagram. Wow. And we were calling out her address on live on air to see if anyone could go and rescue them because mm. they were climbing onto the roof. So all of that kind of stuff, I mean, I'm warm and comfortable in a studio in Melbourne. Mm. I get it that, you know, my life is not in danger and I'm not yeah. having anything hard other than talk. Mm. But it is, it is it does get to you sometimes because we sort of recommend to people, hey, if the news is wearing you down, just switch just, off. Yeah. Turn yeah. it off. Mm. But I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We just need to factor in a few days off here and there mm. just to try and switch off because you yeah. can't be a Yeah, especially at, the, especially at this time as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm. And you might have answered a bit of Joanne's question already but she's wondering with your background and experience do you wish you were reporting from overseas right now that's or are you I happy being at home and it's, I, it's, sorry I interrupt you because I'm no, just so okay. I'm so quick to want to tell you about this because if for me I thought I would really have itchy feet yeah really hard mm. after 12 years overseas to come back and not have two simultaneous passports on the go and a and a bedroom drawer filled with every coinage and mm. notes and, <laughs> and power plugs for whatever country that I might have to race off to. And you know what? I bloody love being back here. Yeah. This is the most stable <laughs> I have been in a job. I mean, yes, I get up at three o'clock in the morning, but I know that I'm coming home to my own bed every night mm. and mm. I can commit to friends and say yes i will have dinner with you on <laughs> saturday night and there is not there's probably only one or two stories in the world that would stop me being able to go and do that so mm. i don't miss it i feel you like i have yeah. my feel mm. i'm 53 now mm. it is exhausting mm. it's exhausting mm. and so when i'm doing the live crosses with the correspondents out there I am just, I am sending them all my good vibes and hoping that they can hang in there because I know that they won't have had much sleep. They would have had demands with so many different um, parts of the organisation wanting mm. to do live crosses with them and that their day will go on for way, way longer than yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And Kelly wonders for you, what has been the most surprising outcome of publishing your book? The lovely responses from people, yeah. which mm. I guess in a COVID year when I missed having the interaction with people, and it's why I really enjoy doing things like this, that you're getting that sort of feedback about the book and you're learning what people think. And, you know, so I'll get messages from you know, I used to be your teacher in grade yeah. two, or <laughs> mm. uh, I remembered your dad, or I've still got a receipt that your dad wrote for a hay bale. Oh, really? Wow. In <laughs> yes. Wow. Someone, someone said that she'd been going through her mother's her mother's drawers and belongings mm. that were moving her mum into a nursing home, and she said, "I found a receipt that your dad had written in his own." 
um, writing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that must be pretty amazing, oh. the sort of random things that yes. people, yeah. absolutely <laughs> random, mm. absolutely random. Mm. And I like Christine's question. She says that she's wanting to know, did you find that growing up in the country was a disadvantage to making a career as a national and foreign journalist? No, no. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to write this book. Because mm. I, think, I think when you grow up in the city, you don't quite understand what it is like to grow up in the country and how it is such a different life. But I think kids who grow up in the country can have very big dreams and if those dreams are encouraged, mm -hmm. my dream was encouraged by the librarian in Kilkeven, uh, Mrs. Leia, who I was able to talk to and interview and who sadly passed away a few months mm -hmm. after I did that. Mm -hmm. But she was telling me what I was like as a seven-year-old coming into the library and getting my books mm -hmm. out. We were allowed to do that on a Friday after school before we headed out of town back home I think that I think it was a privilege to grow up in the country and yes I felt out of place at times and mm. when I went to university in Brisbane I felt like I was a total hick and that I didn't I, I wasn't dressed as beautifully as the others I was naive mm. I never smoked a cigarette <laughs> um, but you know what it didn't it didn't hurt it did it like it mm. was it did there were challenges but i wouldn't swap any of that for the experiences that i've had between then and now yeah yeah and you said when you were writing your book that you went back and interviewed people from your past and that i'm wondering if when your book was published you had some surprise people pop up who um had read your book and remembered you and then got in touch with you Yes, there were definitely a few of those mm. and I wished, and in fact, there were so many comments sent to me directly on Instagram that I wished I'd sort of taken photos of mm. all of them. I'd, I'd sometimes send them through to my family and say, how about this? How amazing is this? Um, including someone who said, I think we're related. Oh, really? <laughs> and, there, and there was also one of the ways that I was able to track down our um, gorgeous plane uh, was that someone had contacted the ABC and said, I think I think I owned that plane. Mm. And I got his number and we talked and we worked out that he'd bought it two people on after dad had sold it. And we had this great conversation about it. He said, oh, I could, you, that car was like a Ferrari, that plane was like a Ferrari. Yeah. You could park <laughs> it so easily. You couldn't ever overload it. He said, although I did put 120 mangoes in once, and that was a bit risky. <laughs> so we had a great conversation about it. And if you could go back and talk to your, maybe your teenage self, what would you say to her? The first thing I would say is, you are not going to believe this, Lisa, but in a few decades, you are going to be sitting on the couch hosting a national breakfast television program, interviewing the lead singer of Spandau Ballet, <laughs> and you've got him on a poster behind <laughs> your bed. <laughs> That's the first thing I would have said. Yeah. Um, the second would have been to just, you know, it is difficult to tell a teenager to have more confidence and just believe mm. in yourself that... I guess it comes with age, but I would have just said, you know what, it is going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. And what have you found the hardest part of writing your book? The, accepting that there are days when you're just not going to have a word come out of mm. it. I would panic a little bit. Mm. Is there something you would do when that happened? I just wouldn't write. You wouldn't, yeah. I just accepted. Mm. I just accepted that you know, you, some days it's just not going to happen. Gonna, yeah. I know there are some authors who work on the basis that you just have to write something, like mm. just get something down. But I thought, no, nah, if it's just not coming, I'm not going to force it. And then there'd be other days where I'd wake up on a weekend at maybe four a.m. and bounce out of bed 
and just want to write for hours and hours. And there was one day I remember I wrote 6,000 words mm. on a Saturday morning. Mm. Um, so it just came totally flowing. totally unexpected. Mm. And it wasn't even what Louise had set me as my assignment <laughs> for the weekend. <laughs> it was something entirely different. I remember sending it through to her saying, you didn't ask me to write about this, but <laughs> I just have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And did you get any tips from any authors? Funny story. When I was reading a, uh, I was listening to, to a podcast with Sally Hepworth and mm. Leah Friedman, and it was very helpful. And when I eventually um, met Sally on the phone, we, we're eventually going to have lunch together one day, mm. but I, um, I said to her, your advice on that podcast was so helpful to me because you had spoken about how you followed the Dirty 330 policy, which was you wake up, you go to the loo and then you just write 330 words no matter what and you just do it you know the, like it, it can be bad words whatever mm. i said i did try to abide by that and i said you know that dirty 330 i did think about that a lot and there was a big pause and she said lisa it's called the nifty 350 oh, right. <laughs> and I had renamed her and we just rolled around laughing and I said oh my god people are going to think I'm writing a porn book or something the dirty 330 that is funny anyway, she said she's going to she's going to be touring in America at some stage mm, and she's going to tell the opposite the side of that story but look I did um you know, I, I, Marion Wilkinson is another uh, friend of mine. She wrote The Carbon Club most recently, um, terrific journalist. She sort of gave advice about, I mean, she is so brilliant in how she sees structure that she immediately said, oh, yeah, 12 chapters, mm. this, this, this is the, that's the plan. I mean, mm. it didn't quite go that way, but she immediately gave me, something to think about and I really appreciated that but mm. you know honestly I was googling how to write a memoir <laughs> and just absorbing whatever I could absorb mm. Mm. and Anthea wonders if you created a special space for your writing oh, I wish but I live in a small apartment and the special space was the dining room table yeah <laughs> And um, Georgie wonders if writing the book conjured up memories you'd forgotten about. Yeah, and so many things since then that I think, oh, didn't write about that in the book. <laughs> um, there were other things, for example, when I talked about how they'd asked me to go back and write a few thousand words about my time at Parliament House in Canberra, mm. um, I ended up Right, ringing the other female reporters who I worked with at the time, we were all about 24, 25, to ask them, was this was this how it was? So, yeah. One of the things I discovered was that I we used to do what they call the doors. You'd go down... ...side the doors for the politicians to arrive now because of security and all the rest of it, but... You do that in the mornings, you get there pretty early to do that, you know, around sort of 6.30, 7 a.m. And I always used to think the other TV reporters were so glamorous. I'd come from Townsville. I hadn't even owned a winter jacket mm. before I started doing that job. Well, I only discovered 25 years later that some of them had um, hairstyled professionally before they arrived at the door oh, that early okay, in the for morning. The, yeah. I said, oh, but that kind of makes me feel better because honestly, you all looked like knockouts. Mm -hmm. And um, just one more question before we finish off. Has this given you a taste to want to write more? Not while I'm doing this job. No. <laughs> no, just too, just too hard. Yeah. Um, I would, I would like to write again. Mm. I have enjoyed the process and the feedback has been encouraging enough that mm. I might venture down that track. But at the moment, this job of co-hosting News Breakfast, of narrating muster dogs, of doing some guest presenting on the Backroads program, that's enough, enough. for me. Enough, yeah. Moment. 
Yeah. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And like I said, really loved your book. Thank you so much. This is where I hold it up again, like a, yeah. a very confident <laughs> author, don't I? <laughs> And the cover, Thanks, look, I love the picture on the cover as well. Would you know say. my grandmother took that photo. Oh, it's really? Like, it's oh. like she must have known that in 50 years' mm. time I was going to need a cover for a memoir. Yeah. <laughs> No, oh, that's lovely. And thanks so much, everyone who joined in and the questions that got asked. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody.